Well, I'm here on behalf of the appellate Edward Cummings. Um, I think I'll reserve four minutes. Four, all right. This case involves an appeal of a uh, final summary judgment entered by the trial court, essentially finding that uh, appellate Ed Dunley uh, may very well be a qualified beneficiary pursuant to the explicit text of the trust under consideration. But the court looked at that explicit language and went outside of the scope of the trust document and looked to, we believe, not extrinsic evidence, but an extrinsic proffer of facts from Appalee, in which they represented essentially that the trustee made decisions which resulted ultimately in the termination of the trust. So because the trust does not exist, the trial court accepted that, ar that argument and found that our client is not entitled to an account. Well, the, the main trust was on the death of the settler was, was distributed outright to the wife, surviving wife, is that correct? And the main trust provided for a, a subtrust that was never created because the reason for the subtrust, which was a, a tax benefit, sort of changed in the law. Is that an oversimplification of what happened? No, I believe that's what the trial, I think that's what the trial court ruled. I think the trial court raised the idea that that was what was going on. Our, our, our position is that the trust specifically says that if the uh, Alice Dunley, James Dunley's wife, survives, that the trustee shall create, they shall create a credit shelter trust up to the amount uh, of the uh, estate tax exemption. And the creation of that trust also then went through some very uh, detailed uh, instructions as to how that money was to be disposed of. And it provided for incremental disbursements of income from the Credit Shelter Trust to Alice Dunley during the course of her life at a minimum of quarterly distributions of that income. But we, uh, do you not concede that the Credit Shelter Trust issue is off the table because it wasn't created, it wasn't funded? Well, we, we don't know, Judge. We, we don't know. The, the representation, and this isn't by way of affidavit on the trial court. There are no affidavits on the trial court level from anyone saying that the assets in the trust, value of those assets, exceeded anything that would have triggered any estate tax liability. We just don't know. We don't know how much was in there. We don't know what the assets were. You say that, and I'm, I feel like I've read that in this record, that there was the information on what the tax liability would have been at the time the trust was created, something, some fairly low number, versus what was actually the case when Mr. Dunley passed away, and that they were vastly different, such that the reasons for the credit shelter trust never would have materialized. Is that really a disputed fact? Well, the only disputed fact is what assets were in the trust at the time of the settler's death. If you look at the settler's will, it provides that the personal property of the uh, deceased James Dunley who created the trust would go to his wife, Alice, and all the residue of his estate would go into the trust. Uh, we don't know what those Well, and it were. says also, if we bypass the credit shelter trust for purposes of this conversation, that the residue of the trust would be distributed to Alice in its entirety. And, and that's more or less what happened here, isn't it? Well, no, Your Honor, we, we don't believe, number one, we don't believe that's what happened because the evidence in the record uh, says it didn't happen. The arguments being made is that the trust essentially ceased to exist as of the day of the separate death because all of the assets, unidentified assets, we don't know what they were, somehow immediately vested so that as of the date of the settler's death, the trust ceased to exist. Our position is that, that that argument and that unilateral action taken by the trustee is not consistent with the settlement. Help me out here. I think the record shows that after Mr. Dunley passed away, Alice paid, recognized the income from the two properties we're talking about, the restaurant and the home slash building, office building. And she paid the taxes on those and she dealt with the maintenance and upkeep of them. And they, they were listed as her assets on her estate inventory when she passed away. So 
as a practical matter, the intent of Mr. Dunley in writing the residue clause was fulfilled, wasn't it? Well, we don't believe that the settler's intent was fulfilled and, and it gets into the provisions of the trust itself, which provide the trustee with authority to care for the surviving spouse in the case of mental incapacity or physical incapacity. It contains spendthrift provisions, which protects the assets in the trust from creditors or alienation. If I came- We don't have any of those issues though. Well, if, if I came before the court, we do have it in the context of the purpose is to carry out the settler's intent. Uh, one of the cases cited by uh, Appley is uh, Horgan v. Cosden. In that case, uh, the, uh, the uh, settler left assets to his son. The son and the remaining beneficiaries, the remainder beneficiaries, qualified beneficiaries, came before the court and said, we just want to terminate it and disperse it. They'd agreed on the amount. The trial court granted that motion. This was the second DCA. The trial court uh, granted the motion uh, over the objections of the co-trustee and basically found that that was consistent with the settler's intent. On appeal, the court ruled, no, that's not consistent. It provided for periodic future payouts of income. It had a spendthrift provision, which protected the assets. And the court found that in terms of judicial modification, uh, the termination of the trust is not favored. Uh, uh, what, what if, what if uh, I forget which brother's name, if Samuel had, when, when Mr. Dunley died, what if the, um, the two properties had been at that moment following his death titled in Ms. Dunley's name? would we be here now? Well, I think we would still be here for the simple reason that the only reason we know those two properties exist is because we searched the public records. For four well, we years, know about it from the inventory of her estate, when the we that you're referring to. Well, the inventory of Alice Dunley's estate? Correct. Well, now, Judge, if you look at the record, you'll find that the amended inventory listing those two properties in her estate was filed two months after we filed our lawsuit seeking an accounting in 2018. It wasn't until February of 19 that well, the, the Alice died died in 2018. How much faster would we need to get the inventory down? She died in September of 18, and the amended inventory was filed in February of 19. We're talking about uh, uh, four or five months before that amended inventory listing them as assets. But the significant point is it was two months after we filed the lawsuit seeking an accounting. I guess from, from our perspective, the underlying issue is once the text of the trust and, and the court in its initial order, there was a partial summary, summary judgment entered in uh, September of uh, 2021. And the court specifically said he understood uh, the argument being made. He understood that the based on the text, Ed Nunley is a qualified beneficiary. Our position is that are we really in a world where once the trust itself identifies very specifically and unambiguously a qualified beneficiary, what is the underlying basis for the court to accept facts from the trustee saying, this is what I did, and therefore there's nothing to account for? What's to keep the trustee from simply coming up and saying, eh, there's nothing there, nothing to account for, Judge. Where does the underlying basis to accept extrinsic evidence come from? Because the law says that the acceptance of extrinsic evidence is improper in a case where the tech where the text of the trust itself is unambiguous and clear as it is here. Our position well, is the trial judge in the in the summer, in the partial summary judgment order was basically saying that your client had 28 months to gen up some conflict with regard to the credit shelter trust and didn't do that. Gen up some conflict. To, to gen up some tribal issue or some factual dispute concerning whether the credit shelter trust had been funded. I mean, the trial court discusses this in addressing your client's contention. Well, yes, Your Honor, and I, and I would I would address that in one basic way. From our perspective, the court did not make findings of fact based on evidence proffered by the appellee. The court made its findings after directing us to present evidence that the credit shelter trust had been funded. Our response to that was, well, in the absence of an accounting, how are we to know? I, that's the underlying problem we always had. We don't know what assets were in this trust when it began. I understand. I understand, I understand it's a 
it seemed like a circular argument. We get into the same thing, but but if we, it's the chicken and the egg. If the uh, if if the qualified beneficiary, the statute requiring an accounting does not say that a qualified beneficiary is entitled to an accounting if the qualified beneficiary can establish that there are assets in the trust, because that would be an easier one. What proof do you have here even any assets there? Well, absent an accounting, we, we can't prove. It, to me, it is it is the opposite. But you, but the, you're, the chicken that has to happen first is you have to be a qualified beneficiary for purposes of getting the accounting egg. You have to be a qualified beneficiary. And with respect to the credit shelter trust, once the your opponent, Samuel, once the case was made that there was no credit shelter trust, didn't the burden shift on that? I mean, if we're quarreling about what the trial court found in the partial summary judgment on the credit shelter trust, I mean, I, mean, I think we're going around in circles, but I'm, I also think the trial judge followed the summary judgment scheme and gave your client sort of an extra bite at the apple to come forward. Well, and, and we get to the secondary issue, which was also argued in the trial level, and that is what happened to the assets of the trust. Uh, the court points out that there, there's a representation that the assets were ultimately conveyed to Alice. Uh, the evidence in the testimony, and the deposition testimony of Sam Duncan does not support that. In fact, it refutes it. It, it, he has testified that income from the Barcelona property during the course of Alice's lifetime was not paid to her, but was paid to his wife. Well, and, it, but it wasn't all of the income, was it? It was more like his wife was collecting sort of a management. Am, am I right about that? Did I misapprehend no, the record? No, I don't believe so, Judge. I think the deposition testimony couldn't be any clearer. Was the income from the property paid to Alice only during her lifetime? No. But Alice recognized that on her tax returns. Well, in terms of the admissibility of the tax returns, they were attached to Rodney Salvati's affidavit with no authentication or anything else. And we did raise the issue of the admissibility of those documents when it comes to that. Let me ask one question on this point. <clears throat> if he was distributing some money to his wife, was he doing so, and does the record address was he doing so in his capacity as trustee? Well, I believe the deposition testimony reflects that he was acting as trustee at that time. Which would be inconsistent with the idea that these properties were devised to Alice in, in, uh, as required by the trust. Yes, Your Honor. Exactly. Uh, and, and there's no question that he continues to if act. If they were devised, there would be no trustee. She'd be the outright owner. Correct. And, and, and the appellee has argued uh, that uh, the trust terminated as of the date of the death of the settler, as did, that's what the, brief, the answer brief says, as did Sam's status as trustee. And yet we have presented numerous documents and evidence in the record to indicate that he filed a notice of trust in his father's estate in um, 2015, almost a year after the uh, death of the settler. We have numerous correspondence in the record between Rodney Salvati, who was representing the estate and ultimately represented the trustee in our case, in which he tells Ed Dunley, uh, we're cleaning up title. This is 2016 now. We're cleaning up title to make sure those properties are in the trust where they belong. Correspondence from Mr. Salvati confirming that Sam Dunley is the trustee. Correspondence from Mr. Dunley indicating that, um, that the, uh, if he has a problem, with the status of the assets, he needs to take it up with the trustee. All of these things created an issue. If and, and, and you talk about delay, we asked repeatedly for information, couldn't get it from 14 to 18. They refused to respond in any fashion or provide any information. We filed suit. It wasn't until we moved for summary judgment that we are now advised for the first time the trust doesn't exist. That's the first time that it's raised. There's no previous communication indicating that there is no trust and there is no trustee. They made this up on the fly four or five years later. Why do I share it up? This is sharing up. They effectively acted as though this trust was active. They dispersed assets to themselves while he remained trustee. The evidence shows that he remained trustee based on documentation for years after the settler's death. And all of this goes against the intent of the settler. If, 
if I was a creditor seeking to execute on these uh, assets, supposedly in the trust, six months after the settler's death, does anybody believe that, that the trustee and, and the parties here would say, yes, those assets are subject to execution because they passed free of the trust the day the settler died? I don't believe the trial court could have modified this trust and terminated it at the request of the trustee on these terms. I think that would have been reversed on appeal because it would have been inconsistent with the intent of the settler. If, if a trial court couldn't have modified the trust under the modification provisions of the trust code, how can the trustee unilaterally do it all by himself? And how can he do it years after the fact? You get into all kinds of issues of fact in the record, but once you get beyond, our position is once you establish that you are a qualified beneficiary under the text, it's a, it's a dangerous place to come and say, well, now, okay, you're a qualified beneficiary in the text of the trust, but now prove what's there, prove what you're entitled to, prove what they did. Two minutes? Well, then, I got two minutes. Oh. Well, well, you got four left, and it's your time. You can use any way you want. Okay, I've got two minutes left, and then uh, four reserved? No, you're at 16. So you have less than four minutes right now for rebuttal. Well, I think I've covered you, everything. Again, I, use it, whatever. However you I appreciate that, Judge. I uh, covered everything I want to cover, so okay. I think I'll go All right. back. Thanks. You'll have four when you come back. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Stacey Haverfield, and I represent the appellee who is the, the trustee of the James Dunley Radical Trust, um, Sam Dunley. For ease, I'm going to refer to the parties and the other people involved by their first name. I mean, no disrespect to anybody. It's just. Ms. Haverfield, pull the uh, microphone a little bit closer to you. Sorry. Thank you. Before you uh, is a very limited issue. Really, the singular issue before you today is, is Ed Dunning, the appellant, a qualified beneficiary under the main trust? And the answer, per the terms of the trust, is no. Let me, let me ask a question that dovetails into the last point that was addressed. I understand your argument that as soon as he, uh, the trustor, the grantor died, uh, Alice was to get the properties and so forth. But after he dies, there seems to be no change in the title. We, uh, that seems to be undisputed. We have your client seemingly acting as trustee still. And if not, I don't know that that's established in the record that he was not. And we're here on summary judgment. And you know, I'm not going to dive into the burden on summary judgment. You fully understand it. But based on this record, how can we conclude that there is no genuine issue of material fact that the trust assets were disposed of to Alice? Um, thank you. There are several things in the record, in our opinion, that support the fact that the, the assets transferred legally and practically, but not administratively, if that makes any sense. So, so we agreed that those two pieces of property still remain titled in the name of the trust, but for all other purposes, including legal purposes, including tax returns, uh, as you pointed out, the amended inventory, uh, she was direct, she, I'm sorry, Alice was but aren't directing- there, aren't there facts inconsistent with that? Apart from the deed? I, based on your client's deposition testimony? Respectfully, I, I don't think so. I, he was, when in his deposition, uh, he was making the argument that income was going from the Barcelona property to his wife, but, but that's not the full picture. But who, who directed that money? Is there, well, let me phrase it this way. Does the record establish that Alice took control and she sent the money to her daughter-in-law? Based on his answers, no. But based on the other documents in the court other file- Other documents where she has listed it on her tax returns money. and so forth. But there's an inconsistency there and-, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that to have resolved the inconsistency, either the deposition or affidavit, something would have had to in fact say or establish that the property indeed was transferred to her and she accepted it. And I understand there's no evidence of disclaimer, but that's an evidentiary question too, isn't it? Yes. And there's no evidence of that. So how do we, on a summary judgment disposition, 
how do we simply assume that what your client's position is is supported legally such that there's no genuine issue of material fact sure. and is entitled to uh, judgment as a matter of law? So, uh, I would say a few things. I'd like to take a step back a moment and, and for an accounting of the main trust. So, I mean, you have the trust before you. The trust is sort of a modification of a bypass trust. Um, but, but really, there's the recognition of two distinct trusts de depending on, you know, on when um, Mr. Dunning dies. The one count complaint deals with an accounting on the main trust. Okay, so now fast forward to the motion for summary judgment. The motion for summary judgment mirrors that. We want an accounting on the main trust. So whether there are assets in the main trust or not assets in the main trust, you know, respectfully is not relevant to the issue of is Ed a qualified beneficiary of that main trust? Are you suggesting that a contingent beneficiary is not entitled to that kind of information? No, I'm not. Is but he a contingent beneficiary under the trust documents? Not, not on the qualifying date, he's not. And, and by my read, the qualifying date is Mr. Donnelly's death. So at Mr. Donnelly's death, assets by paragraph 5.4 are distributed outright to Alice, provided that Alice survived. It's undisputed that Alice survived James Dunley. And so those assets became hers immediately free from well, trust. They should, have, they should clearly they should have become hers. But there seems to be at least some record evidence that in fact they were not fully treated as hers by virtue of a trustee still acting as a trustee when there should have been a trust any longer. And please also keep in mind, I mean, there, there well, was- Well, tell me why, tell me if I'm wrong. Sure, with that. Then, I mean, there was no distinction. So here you have sort of a family run operation and you have Sam who is assisting, you have his wife, Joni, who is also assisting. You have Alice who's, you know, given some direction. I mean, Alice was an accountant. She was, you know, quite intelligent, very involved, uh, you know, understood business transactions. And so- Is any of that of record? I mean, is all, all of what you're saying sounds great, but how much of that is developed in this record? Well, I would I would make the argument that it, as far as the, the income goes, she claimed the income, I mean, that her tax returns are part of the record. So the judge was entitled to rely on those. Um, the, the federal state tax return, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. The, the Florida state tax return, I apologize, was made a part of the record. So he has the, the, the right to rely on well, that. We, ha we have Sam's deposition. Right. Correct. And help me out here. I think that Sam did testify to some of his mother's business dealings and her qualifications and capacity and how she behaved during the period after James's death and up to hers. He did. Help us out with that. Uh, I mean, that, that would go toward her um, involvement. I mean, it would also go toward the fact that she had, you know, full knowledge that these assets were legally and practically hers, and then she utilized them as such. Um, Is it, does, does Sam ever explain, and I read his deposition, and I, does he ever explain what role Alice played, if any, in the, you know, who was it that made the distributions to Joan? Not fully. That is not fully explained. But that, but he does answer. Because that's question. sort of critical, as, as Judge Silverman has zeroed in on, isn't it? I, I don't, I, well, I actually then, don't. Yeah, I just need to add to that question. Please. Does he say that I was doing this as her son, I wasn't doing this as trustee? But he, at that point, was not acting as trustee. Well, but we don't know that, do we, we? We do. We do because there were no tax returns filed. She filed her tax returns. He did not file tax returns for the trust, so we do know that. But that could have been misconduct on his part, couldn't it? No, because the assets, for all intents and purposes, had been transferred out to... The trust says that the assets shall be transferred to her, which suggests that there has to be conduct by the trustee to make that transfer. Title of the property was unchanged, so we know that didn't happen. Now we have some other things that are in conflict with that uh, titling, but we don't have him saying, I had in fact dissolved the trust. Yes, I made a mistake. I didn't transfer the title and I wasn't acting as trustee anymore. Now I was 
being a dutiful good son and my mom wanted the money to go to my wife and that's why it happened we don't have any of that do we we what we do have i mean not not as you outlined it right there but what we do have in the record are um, his testimony that uh, you know, no tax returns were ever filed, his testimony that these assets were to be transferred to his mother, and only the administrative component of that was not completed. So everything else you would completed. agree that if <coughs> Samuel had effectuated the transfers of the deeds to these two properties, we would not be here at all. Is that would, we might, <laughs> but for our purposes, it certainly would make my argument stronger because then we would have that last step, that last administrative step that was necessary. And that was really part of, I mean, that that's within exactly what you expect for a conventional trustee's responsibilities to be are things like ensure that title to trust assets gets transferred pursuant to the trust instrument, i.e. to Alice. And for, what, six years, this doesn't happen. True, but I, I would again sort of draw us back to you know where we were. So we were in, in a motion for summary judgment, really on an accounting of the main trust. But as as you've read, because the main trust reads that trust then collapses. It has an outright distribution if Alice survives, and it's undisputed that Alice survived. So the the, the cleanup, if you will, or the winding up of the trust. Um, does not affect the fact that those assets transferred over. You also have um, his testimony, and then you have you know other argument at the time of the motion for summary judgment that the credit shelter trust was never funded, and um, no one can. And he did. Uh, let me back you up there for just a minute. If I'm not mistaken, Sam testified to the tax parameters regarding the decision on the credit shelter trust. Am I wrong about that? Can you help? Uh, I forgive me. I don't remember that, but I do remember in the memo in opposition to the first motion for summary judgment, there there was a footnote, and the footnote read that one of the key components for not funding the credit shelter trust was the fact that in 1984 the amount was um, under under seven figures. It was like 340,000 or, or some such. I might be getting that number wrong. But at the time of Mr. Dunley's death in 2014. The, the value was in excess of five million. And so the record on that, is that something the court took, I, I knew I'd read it somewhere in this record. Is that something the court took judicial notice of or where did that fact come from about the tax parameters? Uh, that, well, and we don't have a transcript of the motion for summary judgment hearing. So I don't know what was stipulated to at the time of the hearing. What I, I do know is the um, Florida estate tax um, notice was, was presented to the court, plus you have that footnote, um, plus you have been in the argument of counsel. This credit shelter trust was never funded. And the reason it was never funded was primarily because it wasn't necessary to take advantage of the, the unified credit. I mean, just simply wasn't necessary. They didn't have the assets that, that would generate the need for any sort of minimization of federal state tax liability. So it was never funded. And I think importantly, as it relates to that, is the fact that nobody nobody cared about the credit shelter trust. I mean, in fact, the appellant specifically rejected, you know, any sort of interest in an accounting for the credit shelter trust. But there is no remaining trust in the main trust. So our position is, uh, Sam was well within his discretion as trustee at the time his father died, right? Because he did follow the notice of trust. So there was like, there, there was certainly a moment in time that he was acting as trustee so that he could follow the notice of trust so that he could eventually transfer the properties over. But that moment in time was for a winding up once he realized there was gonna be no tax liability generated on Alice's passing. From there, you see her tax returns. I mean, her, her tax returns claim of the income, her, What's the evidentiary predicate for the admissibility of the tax returns? Well, one, I'm going to argue that it was waived because no one, no one made any arguments as to the evidence being submitted at the motion for summary judgment. But also, it's my understanding that the court at a motion for summary judgment hearing can take into consideration, I think it's under subsection C, items in the record. And these were certainly documents in the record. And the, the court even took 
the trial court even took a conservative route. Well, okay, so I, I brought this credit shelter trust to your attention. You, you seem to be, you know, not paying attention or at least, you know, garbling up the two trusts. You didn't really recognize that there was a difference. However, I'm giving you this opportunity to talk to me about what evidence do you have that this credit shelter trust was funded or was ever created in any way, shape, or form? Because otherwise, you're not qualified beneficiary entitled to an accounting. And, and not only could they not do that, but the response was, we don't need to, we're not interested in the credit shelter trust. In fact, I think the, the verbiage used was that's mere surplusage. And so they immediately rejected the credit shelter trust, the only spot where by, by definition, um, Ed could have been a qualified beneficiary of a trust, but they rejected that out of hand. And again, I would, I mean, this has been what has been maintained all along. You know, the one count complaint was as to the main trust. The initial motion for summary judgment was as to the main trust. There was a complete rejection of the credit shelter trust. And that resulted in the order. They could not show that that had ever been funded. And we would make the further argument here on appeal that because that was never properly raised before the trial court, that it's waived because he, they may not raise it for the first time here. One and two, they invited the error by rejecting it out of hand. I mean, they could have taken some steps to to try to you know grab on and amend a pleading or have something tried by consent, but they failed to do so. But as it relates to the the main trust, there is no read based on on the, the terms of the main trust that makes Ed or Sam as a beneficiary a qualified beneficiary because again, there was no continuing marital trust. The, the assets that were to be distributed to Alice through the main trust pursuant to paragraph 5.4 were distributed outright. There's one more problem with that. <clears throat> and this goes back to your client's deposition, where he says at one point that uh, Alice essentially said the property would be his partial of the property. And he actually says in the deposition that I treated them and executed leases on the property as owner. So he's not claiming in his deposition that he transferred the property to his mom. He's claiming what's now his property. Alfred. Which so is inconsistent with other documents in the record. Well, I mean, read as a whole, I don't think so. And I, I respectfully well, disagree. What his words, Ms. Hammerfield? No, well, he was asked certain questions and he gave answers to those questions. Did, your, read, did your side clarify those answers to make clear what the truth was, if this isn't the truth? There was no follow-up. I will, I will give you that. Was but, there any effort to correct the depositions with the radishes? Not that I'm aware of. Not that, not that made it into the record. Not that I'm aware he of. He says, Mom told me it's mine. Gonna be mine when she's gone. It was already mine. And then he says something that's inconsistent with one of the positions that your client has asserted in the trial court. He says he did all the work on it. He did all the maintenance, all the repairs, everything. Well, he was a contractor, so he did do a lot and he oversaw a lot. But I would make the argument that you can't, one can't just cherry pick that particular item. But this is summary, okay, but this is summary judgment. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's fair enough. But, but also in the record were um, Alice's will, which gave everything to Sam. So he, he wasn't he wasn't uttering at the time of his deposition, which was subsequent to the motion for summary judgment. No, he said he was treating it that way from the time his father died. But he, he knew about the will. Alice changed her will, I, if I'm not mistaken. So Mr. Dunley died in April of 2014. Alice changed her will in August of 2014. And so he was well aware of this. He, I mean, he knew that he was going to be the sole beneficiary. He knew that Ed had received distributions all along. He knew the the, the friction but as a practical matter, Ed may end up with nothing based on you know, documenting, appropriately documenting and establishing the facts. He may end up with nothing, but I am, I'm, I, it's obvious I'm troubled by this being resolved on summary judgment in the manner it was resolved based on discrepancies in the record as to factual issues. Well, I would, meet, I would just make the argument that taken as a whole, the, those factual allegations are not as inconsistent as they would be if you if you took them piece by piece. So you know here again you have an individual who was not well versed in you know trustee lingo and was simply saying what he was doing with the with the property as it related to the family business. So he he wasn't um, thinking okay well I need to distinguish myself as trustee because in his mind he was no longer trustee. 
everything was operating as it should with Alice giving the directions and, you know, with her claiming the end, because there, you know, there's no, no scheme to fraud or there, there isn't any of that because there's no allegation of that either. But I mean, the tax returns were timely fi filed. The will was properly changed. I think this will be my last question. Did he actually say in his deposition anywhere that I never transferred the titles to my mom because it was a mistake not to do so? As I stand here, I can't, I, I, I can't remember that as I stand here. Okay. I, I, I don't know I have to go back in a moment, which I, I would, I will happily do. But, um, I mean, I've, even, I've read it. I don't think, maybe I missed it, but I don't think it's enough. Well, and even the, I mean, even the trial court recognized what is troubling you, which is these properties remain. So basically we have an, un, the winding up has that last step that hasn't been completed, but that doesn't mean that legal transfer didn't happen. It doesn't mean that the practical transfer didn't happen. And so just by virtue of the fact that those assets remain titled in the name of a trust that the moment they are, are redeeded, the trust collapses, it doesn't revive some sort of um, springing contingent right. So our, our position is by the terms of the trust, you know, we, we determine qualified beneficiaries as of the date of James Dunley's death. When he died, that was an outright distribution to Alice. So the, the, both contingent remainder folks, Ed and Sam, went away because that property should have just been distributed outright to Alice. So the fact that there was a mistake on the at the very end doesn't change the terms of the trust and how that property was supposed to flow. And it doesn't resurrect, right. frankly, a non-existent um, right to an accounting. So we would respectfully request that you affirm the orders on appeal um, and uh, allow the summary judgment to stand. Thank, Thank you. You have four minutes, sir. Thank you. So, in response to one question, uh, Sam provided no testimony as to tax issues, and he did not testify that he never filed tax returns or didn't do anything. He testified he didn't remember. The troubling aspect of this to me is we act as though these two properties, Barcelona and Tammy Amory, are the only thing we're dealing with. The reality of it is we don't know. If these two properties weren't transferred to her, what other properties weren't transferred to her? And, and the idea that the trust terminated automatically on the date of the settler's death, I think is somewhat illogical. The reality of it is the trust didn't terminate until the trustee made the conscious decision not to fund the credit shelter trust. Uh, the argument on the trial will seem to be that that was self-operating. And you get into evidentiary issues. There's no affidavit here as to what the assets were in the trust at the time of the settler's death. There's no affidavit as to the uh, limits in terms of tax uh, credits or tax, uh, state tax liability. The, all of those things were presented to the trial court by way of argument by trial counsel. She references a footnote in his memo. That is how these issues were presented to the trial court. There is not one affidavit in the trial record supporting any of the representations that were made to the court. The implication seemed to be that it was necessary for the qualified beneficiary to prove it. But Sam Dunley not only testified that he treated uh, the properties effectively as his own and ran them, he also testified that during his mother's life, they considered the Barcelona property to be his wife's property. Now, where he got that, I have no idea. Um, so the ultimate question is, he says he wasn't the trustee after the settler's death. He files a notice of trust in February of 15, almost a year. After Mr. Salvati is counsel for the estate and apparently counsel for the trustee, he ultimately acted as counsel for the trustee, is sending letters saying Sam hasn't resigned as trustee. We're, we're making sure that the properties are properly conveyed into the trust. And we're talking about March of 16 now, two years after the settler's death. And a subsequent letter in mid March of 16 saying, if you got a problem, take it up with the trustee. Sam has never indicated that he wasn't acting as trustee. He continues to act as trustee. He simply ignored the trust documents, and there's absolutely nothing in the record to support all of the representations made by counsel uh, for Athlete on the trial level. Uh, we believe that once the text of the trust established a qualified beneficiary, extrinsic evidence, and in this case, no extrinsic evidence, but a proper of extrinsic facts was inappropriate. It was a basic issue of account. What was in the trust on the day of the settlement death? And what happened to it? If it didn't go into the uh, credit shelter trust, where did it go? 
We believe that the qualified beneficiaries are entitled to that. We would ask that the summary judgment in Iowa County be reversed and the case be sent back uh, either for further proceedings or with a, an order, we believe an order should be entered uh, directing the summary judgment be entered in 